so we decided at the very last minute to change the name of this talk from this graphic design system to code is a material. We hope the reasons for this will be clear as we get into the talk. Um, we also like to say that it is very important uh, for us that you understand that all of these ideas that we're presenting today are in no way fully formed um, and should not be interpreted as a given solution to anything. Uh, this is all a work in progress that is helping us understand and frame the kind of work uh, design practice that we're trying to build. Um, but let us first introduce ourselves. Brad already did a pretty good job at <laughs> expanding our bios, but we can say something, uh, something new. Um, my name is Martin Bravo. I come from a traditional graphic design background. I worked at the architecture office Elemental, led by architect Alejandro Ravena, at Base Design um, New York, and later at O'Reilly Media, where I met Rune and worked together. Um, as I started learning programming, I started learning programming, programming out of a need for uh, realizing my designs, um, and I slowly started adopting code as part of my practice. I still consider myself a designer, even though I currently spend a lot of my time programming. And hello, everybody. My name is Rune Madsen, and I also tend to describe myself as a designer who happens to use code as my primary tool. Um, I used to work at the New York Times, then at O'Reilly Media, and for the last few years, I've taught design and new media at the Interactive Telecommunications Program at uh, New York University and at the um, Interactive Media Arts Program at NYU Shanghai. And Martin and I, as Brad nicely said, we run a company called Design Systems International that we often refer to as a deeply technical design studio. Uh, and as you can see, we have the term design system in our, in our name. But as you will see in this talk, we use that term very broadly to describe all kinds of projects that are deeply embedded into the digital medium that we're designing for, such as brand systems, custom design tools, complex media websites, reactive interfaces, all the things Brad said. Um, and the common denominator in our work is not so much what we do, but how we do it. And that also happens to be the focus of the talk today. Uh, so many of the ideas that we're going to present today, you can also find in the book that I'm writing called Programming Design Systems. You can find it on programmingdesignsystems.com. And it's a free book that teaches the fundamentals of graphic design by replaces the tra replacing the traditional static tools with code. Uh, and I'll try to do a little pitch at the end to have you sign up for the newsletter. Um. So uh, we'll spend the first, the first half of the talk framing the current design practice by looking at the origins of the discipline. Um, and we'll then use these four projects to um, use them as examples of the ideas that we're, we're going to be talking about. Um, we wanted to introduce them in the beginning, so you have a frame of reference and a context up front when we're mentioning them afterwards. So from the top left, you, we have uh, CCC, which is a new art house cinema and cultural center that is opening soon in um, later this year. We have the MIT Libraries Generation Tool, um, which was a collaboration uh, with Michael Barut's team at Pentagram, where we joined as technical partners to create this generator. Um, we co also collaborated with O'Reilly Media um, to create a unified component library for the platforms, in the, their platforms, including a documentation website and tooling. And lastly, Noa Noa, which is an electronic music venue that opened a few months ago. Um, for them, we created a dynamic identity, internal design tools, and we also led the art direction for the space, and we created a connected uh, screen system that spans throughout the venue. Even though some of, um, some of you may think that only the O'Reilly Media project is a design system, we consider all of them design systems in their own way. Um, but we'll come to that, to back to that later. So we'd like to begin this talk by asking you a question that we, in our design practice, we think about a lot. And that is, what are design systems a symptom of? Or said another way, like, what is the reason why design systems are so popular uh, or have become so popular over the last five years? And uh, a good way to answer this question is always to look back in history. And we don't have to go that far to find these 
graphic standard manuals that became really popular in the late 60s. Um, so a standards manual is in spirit actually very close to what we call a design system today. You take an identity, you chop it up if, into reusable parts, and you make this manual to explain how to use the system. And there were thousands of these manuals created, and many of you probably know the famous ones, such as the New York City subway system. Um, and for these manuals, they were a symptom of a broad shift in the way things were done in the design world that is best explained by this quote by Jack Burnham uh, from his essay, Systems Aesthetics, from 1968, that I really adore. Uh, we are now in transition from an object-oriented to a systems-oriented culture. Here, change emanates not from things, but from the way things are done. And for graphic designers in the 60s and 70s, the demand for design products suddenly changed with the global brands and the vast range of products they had to design for. So the graphic designers were tra traditionally responsible for all of the design production themselves and now had to figure out how to instruct other people on how to do the design. Um, so the solution to this became the graphic standards manual, and it was really a symptom of a need for designing for very complex systems at scale. Uh, so back to the question, uh, we jump a couple of decades ahead, and we can argue that design systems are a symptom of the exact same thing, just in a new medium. So a need for designing for complex digital systems at scale. And the big difference, as many of you know, is that this digital systems are much, much more complex. They are interactive, so this linear narrative from static products are replaced by a really complex set of states. They have dynamic data, so the former static layouts are now dynamic and has to accommodate tons of different types of content. Uh, and they use animation and motion, which I know Val will talk about later in this conference. Um, and finally, which is a big one, they are all built in software, which traditionally is not the language of design. But much in the same way as the manual created a recipe for the design process in the 60s and 70s, design systems have really become, as you know, a go-to recipe for making digital products today. So what we're interested in is that one perplexing thing that happened with the standards manuals is that as their adoption grew, so did a monoculture in graphic design. Uh, and this is obviously a very simplified view of what happened, but you could argue that this monoculture was driven by the need for these brands to be reproducible. So the manuals enforce these, enforce these really grit, um, strict grit type and um, color systems. And because they were easy to understand and comprehend, designers adopted them without really questioning the implications. Um, and we think that some of the critique of this can be directed at design systems today so in the same way as the standards manual. They offer a very clear solution, the component library, to a very complex problem, and that has driven the adoption of them. Um, but design systems also come with assumptions that rarely are questioned, or it can be hard to question. Uh, so designers end up making really drastic decisions about their products simply by following the best practices of building a component library. Uh, so one of these assumptions is that a design system should have a color palette that is flexible and composable. Um, and this means that you just define this set of evenly spaced colors from across the color spectrum and let designers pick and choose whenever they implement a new feature. Uh, but this is actually also an approach that, is, that really lacks a point of view, and it's a very narrow definition of how color can be used in digital products. And uh, another example would be buttons, where the assumption is that a design system should have primary and secondary buttons, often with these inverted versions to be used on white or pure color. Um, and this is, of course, a response to a real problem of needing buttons that signal different action types but the common instinct is to go to the predefined solution to that problem, which in this case is proven to work in pretty much any context, but it also lacks a point of view. Uh, and just like the manuals, if there are enough of these assumptions, the result is that design systems enable a monoculture across the field of digital design. And some of this is really healthy because you're standardizing patterns for users, but it could also be argued that a lot of this standardization is something that ends up benefiting the designer and the organization and not the user. 
And our point here is that design systems are just one method for designing for complex systems at scale, but it shouldn't be mistaken as the only method. Um, and so when Gina invited us to speak at this conference, we decided to try to spend our talk trying to give you our perspective of some of these issues that we have battled in our own work. Um, so we want to frame this talk around another question, taking a step back and thinking about um, if we stop just focusing on component libraries, what are the ideas that should inform a modern design practice? What are the ideas that allow us to be really truthful to the digital medium so we can design products and projects that really fully explore the potential of technology and be diverse and playful and joyful? Um, so what follows now for the rest of the talk uh, is us trying to answer that question by talking about some of the ideas that inform the work in our design practice. And that takes us back to the idea that gave the title to a talk, the new title to a talk, which is that code, like any other medium, is a material to be explored. We think that many people would agree that since the beginning, digital design has been a field that has been detached from the materiality of code. This division between design and engineering um, was a very natural development because each field simply chose what it was very good at. Designers kept working with the static tools they were familiar with, and engineers kept using programming for creating the systems. And despite the massive amount of progress that we have seen in the tools for designing digital products, this static legacy is still very much present in the tools that uh, designers use today. We are still encouraged to design for dynamic systems by creating a series of static pages representing the different states of the application. And we find it very interesting how the field of design, and especially design education, drew a line in the sun and decided that graphic design was about static layouts. One reason might be related to what, to what Donald Knuth describes in, in, as the transition from design to meta design. He says, meta design is much more difficult than design. It's easier to draw something than to explain how to draw it. Like with the standards manual, designers uh, are moving from a, from a world where they draw things to a world where they have to explain how to draw those things. Only that the explaining now needs to happen in code. And that, for many, has been a hard leap to make. Uh, but the result is that designers are now creating systems without necessarily having access to the right tools for creating these systems. And this is especially perplexing when you uh, when you look at back at the birth of modern design, for example, at the, at the Bauhaus School um, in Germany, whose ideas pretty much shaped the modern design practice. These were actually places that were entirely driven by a desire to explore the complexity of materials. As you can see in this diagram, the, every student had to go through classes that taught materials such as metal, wood, stone, textiles, and most of these classes were focused mostly on exploring these materials by using the newest industrial machinery available on them. The handsome man you see here is William Addison Dwiggins, who coined the term graphic design in the 1920s. He was known as a typographer and illustrator, but when you, look, when you read about his work and you look at these pictures of his studio, you realize that mostly he described the work through the craft of printmaking. The other word he had for describing his work before, uh, besides graphic designer was printer designer. That one ne never really caught on, but it was probably a more accurate description of, of his work. And perhaps the, the um, best example is uh, the work of Charles and Ray Eames, who are uh, celebrated as two of the most influential industrial designers in modern history. We think of them as designers who would mostly work with pen and paper, but in practice, they were devoted to exploring the production processes to such an extent that they created their own machine to uh, fabricate molded plywood splints. And without these machines, they would have never been able to design the famous chairs that they're most known for. And this argument of code as material is not something new. It's something that we both, uh, Rune and I, learned when we were studying uh, uh, the interactive 
telecommunications program at New York University, um, where many of these ideas have been practiced for decades. Of all the things that, that ITP has taught us, what resonated the most with us is that programming is just another expression of the human uh, experience and that it is inherently a creative, a creative discipline. The idea here is that mo a modern design practice should explore the field of design through the materiality of code, approach digital design as traditional designers would, getting to understand the possibilities and limitations of a material and using them to inform the design process. We're not saying that everyone should code. It's really an argument to say that in the design process, uh, there should, code should be included as part of it because the, digital, the final product will be made of the same material, which is code. So another broad idea that informs the work uh, is that the dynamic aspects of digital products should be considered for their visual identities too. Um, or if you put it another way, why should our design assets be static when the platform is dynamic? And this is probably not a controversial statement because design studios have explored these ideas for a long time. Here we have four examples that demonstrate this. Uh, from the top left, Casa de Musica by Sagmeister and Walsh from 2010. We have the Dutch National Museum of World Cultures by Lava from 2008. We have the MIT Media Lab by Pentagram from 2014 and the Whitney Museum by Experimental Jet Set from 2013. And these are all design systems that go beyond just defining the logo, colors, and typography, but make the entire identity something that can adapt to wherever it's used, whether it's print or physical space or digital media. Uh, the thing, however, is that very few of these projects explore this materiality of code that Martine is talking about. Um, and this is something that we are really interested in exploring. Uh, with this project, uh, the identity for Noah Noah that we finished earlier this year. So we knew from the beginning that we needed to build a recognizable identity that could exist in both their physical space, printed material, and online media. And we came up with this unifying principle of the scrolling marquee uh, with the constant horizontal movement um, as the ones you typically see in older, older music venues and cinemas and so on. And we, with the help of a very talented font designer, Wichi Hei, we designed a typeface that reinforces this horizontality. So um, it's variable, it's a variable typeface that can vary its width from the very compressed to the very extended. Uh, and this font was created in two versions, the one you see here for the digital space and a pixel-based version for the low-res screens in the physical space. And in this way, the font connects the visual language between these two spaces through this uh, marquee movement. And uh, Noah Noah needs to produce hundreds of assets a month for many different types of events. So this new identity had to be dynamic enough to adapt to the styles associated with different musical genres. So you see here is just a sampling of some of the work they have done that we have not done with this identity over the last six months. And we'll get back to some of the tools we created to make that happen. <clears throat> so another project that really summarizes this idea of the dynamic visual identity is CCC. And uh, the core of the identity became this very iconic logo with the three Cs, as you see here, uh, that inspired a grid system based on the rule of thirds that is a very flexible container that can adapt to media of any size. Um, so with this project, we had this constant battle between making a design system that is easy to recognize while also giving it enough uh, flexibility to work across all of the platforms where it will live. And this animation just shows a few of the different iterations we can get with the posters using these simple, pure colors and the dynamic grid system uh, looks like this. And so if you're interested in this idea of dynamic identities, this book is now finally back in print. It has been sold out for so long, um, called Dynamic Identities in Cultural and Public Context. It's an academic treatment by Ulrike Felsing, but it's really interesting and a way to explore how design assets can go from being something static to something dynamic and kind of serve the purpose of the, the, the environment they live in. 
And so going back to the, the materiality of code, the practical consequence of treating code as a material is that the design process should happen within the constraints of the medium. We believe that the creative push and pull that comes from working within the constraints of the actual medium is invaluable and very hard to get when you're working on tools that only simulate that environment. You might argue that this way of working can allow designers to come up with design solutions that are more interesting and truthful to the media. Successful digital products not only depend on the visual design, as you probably know, uh, but only on, also on things like responsiveness, loading, loading behavior, loading speed, and behavioral details that can only be accurately defined in code. Of course, we don't only use code, but adding code and functional prototypes to our toolset has helped us a lot in our creative process. For example, for Noah Noah that you just saw before, um, we went through many iterations uh, before getting to the final result. And as you can see here, many, many of them didn't look great. But they helped us understand the dynamics of the system and also explain, to our, explain them to our client. We had the luxury of working from a place of mutual trust with them. Um, and we also had to work very, very fast. We actually had a month and a half to do everything, including the screen systems. Um, so sharing these prototypes helped us a lot to communicate the concept much more precisely and accurate than it would have been without, with static mockups. Or in this example, while developing the, some learning products for uh, O'Reilly Media, uh, the design system was already there. So most of the design decisions were not around the visual language, but the behavior, of the, user and the behavior and the user experience of using this tool. So it only made sense to us to explore these things in code and not in the mockups. The last idea that we're going to talk about is uh, one that consistently comes up when people talk about uh, right, uh, design systems. The idea that these projects are less about technology and more about humans and collaboration. That design systems are really about creating workflows and for humans and not about code. We think this is an important lesson that should be true for any digital design product. Uh, designers should stop making guidelines and instead figure out how to, they can make the life easier for the users of their design. This quote by Scott Bergen expresses much of this. Um, he says, designers love to craft design principles, rules for their coworkers to follow. But this rarely works. The principles always create more work. There is little motivation for anyone to change their own behavior simply because someone with no authority posts a sign. Smart designers study how their coworkers' tools and processes make it hard to do good design, and they make better ones. There is material for a whole talk on human aspects of running a design system project, but smarter people than us have um, actually done a much better job than we could do. There is actually a really interesting talk coming later today at 2.30, I think, that we're look looking forward to. But one thing that fewer people talk about that we would like to focus we, will, we think it should be, should be a focus for any modern design practice, is the fact that along with these workflows, there is an opportunity for new tools that can make life easier for the people consuming your design. For the case of the design system for O'Reilly Media, one focus was designing and developing the component library and the documentation side. But another one was a set of tools that people at the organization could be used to use the design system. One concern was that it was taking designers and developers too long to test new features. So we included as part of the project a, genera a generation tool that allowed anyone in O'Reilly to O'Reilly Media to generate new projects, uh, skeletons in just a few seconds. This prevented a lot of a ton of double work, and it helped actually putting some joy into using the design system. Uh, so back to Noah Noah and the internal design tools. Uh, so a big part of that project was figuring out how to support the workflow of this new music venue that has a ton of requirements for assets. So the first tool we created, which has this really rough design, just like the, the, the venue itself, uh, was this poster generation tool that allows their team to create animated posters uh, bound to the rules of the new design system and the grid system and the typography and so on. And the realization that we had is that most of the time, the final user will never see our designs. 
It's always designs that are done by a person at the organization interpreting our design systems. So one way to do this is give guidelines. Another way to do that is make very specific domain-specific tools that allows them to do their work really well and really fast. Um, so that was the poster generation tool. Another tool for Noah Noah is for creating content for the many screens they have in the physical space, the outside marquee, the programming screen, the two bar screens. And these, um, these tools pull data directly from the website, uses the custom pixel font to generate a video that's optimized for the screen, uh, as you can see in these videos with the marquee on the outside um, and the programming screen running here in the inside of the space are the bar screens. Uh, on the top floor and one on the lower floor. But the most complex one was this one, the giant VJ screen that Martin put together by hand um, <laughs> that is in the space that requires this special dithering algorithm to make the videos look really good. So what we did, we created this tool that allows you to play a, an existing playlist of videos or a live stream from a VJ directly through this tool, and everything can be controlled via a mobile app, which you have a really bad video of right here. But that's Martin. There you go. <laughs> um, and so this idea of the internal design tools is really important to us, because you can talk about humans and collaboration and workflows, but you also have to find ways they can collaborate around tools. Um, and we have used this approach for several projects, including this MIT library's logo generator that's written in processing at the place where processing was invented, which was kind of fun. Uh, and for the CCC uh, identity, we make this, made this um, grid generator that allows you to quickly generate the base grid in any size with the colors, uh, and then download an SVG that you then continue on with in, photo, or in um, Illustrator. And the exciting thing here for us is that it has become much easier to create these tools. And we move away from these monolithic design tools such as Photoshop and Illustrator to a world where we combine those traditional tools with project-specific ones, like in this case. It's not replacing, but we are augmenting the workflow to make them work much faster. Um, and those, that's it. That was some of the ideas that we've been thinking about. We hope that this exercise a framing concepts of design systems as something broader than a component library has been helpful to at least some of you. Uh, here is the, there's some people taking photos. I'll wait a second. <laughs> okay. Um, and here's the pitch for the book. If you're interested in these things, but a much more hands-on approach to graphic design in code, uh, go to programmingdesignsystems.com um, and sign up for the newsletter. But what we're most excited about is talking about these ideas with those of you who are also interested in these things. So if you see us on the floor, uh, we'll be around. Come and say hi. And if you need an excuse, we have a lot of these generative stickers that you can put in your laptops. So ask for one and say hi, and let's talk about things. And system. Uh, if you want to talk or work with us, you can reach out. We have three websites. Design systems international, international design systems, and systems international design. Uh, that's our email, and so on. Thank you. Uh, we we have a lot to talk about um, in a short amount of time, so I think that a lot of this is going to spill over into the into the ongoing day. So please seek them out. So uh, first of all, your work is incredible. Uh, thank, you. thank you. Thanks for sharing. But also, I I love how you touched on that sort of monoculture, and this is something I encounter a lot. And and I don't know if you've experienced this with your own clients and and stuff, and maybe maybe not. It's like a literal question I get a lot is, why doesn't everybody just use material design? Right. It's like, mm -hmm. here's this great design system. It seems to do all the thing. Here's all the buttons. Here's right. all the everything. It seems to build all the kinds of interfaces we need. And you're sort of like, I just, through your work, you sort of are showing. It's like, here's what you get if you don't go that right. route. But like, what, what, can you like reflect on that? Like that, that sentiment of like, where this monoculture is coming from, or like what's like leading people down that road of like, mm -hmm. oh, we just need to, you know, we need to make stuff. This system right. exists. 
Well, I think in some way it's a really understandable thing. Like mm. you are an organization and it, there is this idea of design systems and then there's the common way of solving that problem, which is make a rounded, colorful button that looks this way. Yeah. And those two things can be very hard to separate, I think. Um, and it's not that that approach doesn't work. There's some amazing work being done with design systems at, at large corporations. Yeah. But the point is also that they, material design and bigger design systems tackle the problem around scale. And that's just one thing, one problem you have in the digital realm. And the projects we work on, many of them had scale, many of them have, don't have scale. Yeah. So you want to pick the right thing. Yeah, right. yeah, you got to like pick it, like when does it make sense to do more of like a bespoke thing or something right. that might take more effort versus, right. mm -hmm. yeah. and, and also this, this idea of starting from, a, many people think design system and then think let's start from a component library. Yeah. And then you think drop down buttons, all these things. Yeah. But who says that your UI should not be audio based or yeah. like not, or entirely text based yeah. there should be no color like you yeah. are making really drastic decisions when you start from a this idea of the material design yeah. component like yeah. and i think that the, an important point there is that the point of view is something that is so important for any brand and any design uh, product that by adopting too many of these assumptions you end up lacking that point of view so you become unrecognizable because you're not showing something different than the rest. Yeah. Um, and it's, it's very tempting because it, it's, it's, a, it's a paid way, yeah. in, a, in a sense. But um, then you run the risk of, of losing, in a way, your identity or like not showing really the, the differentiating as aspects of your product or yeah. what you're doing. Yeah. So one of my favorite quotes from Jeffrey Zeldman, I'm paraphrasing here, is like, every client wants something that's uh, never been done before and totally unique, but has also worked for three of our competitors. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> it's just exactly. like, it's like you, we want those, those like paved roads, as you right, said, but right. like we also want some, some unique stuff as right. well. Um, who works in static design tools here? Tools like, you know, whether that's Sketch or Figma or, you know, all these it's other okay. tools. It's okay, we do like, too. Ra ra do. Raise your hands. <laughs> raise your hands. Proudly, like yeah. this is, uh, you touch on something just super important, uh, you know, like sitting there rocking in my chair, you know, talking about sort of functional prototypes, getting into, into code faster, using code as a design material and stuff mm -hmm. like that. Like how do you see at, at, at places or what, what advice do you have for, for people working in those static tools still and, and relying them to do their job? Uh, but like just at an organizational level, like how do you sort of help facilitate this more sort of uh, functional prototype driven process, right. especially whenever it's like, well, we have to create the comps in order to get the <laughs> exactly. approval and then we get it, you right. know, and yeah. all of that. So how do you overcome that? Well, I, th I think one part of this is also that we're super lucky. We are three people in the company, like us two and another person, and we work in code together. We yeah. don't have the problem of scale that many big organizations have. No. Um, and our, our point is not that everyone should code. Our point is, like, my problem with these tools is that you are living in a simulation of where your design goes. So you can't explore the full extent of the technology by thinking in these static pages, even like, and there are amazing tools who make this easier, like Framer and Figma is getting better. There are yeah. ways to quickly prototype interaction, but you're still building up, tearing down and building up again. Yep. And I would just love to see tools that explore ways to kind of what we try to do with the O'Reilly Media project generator, like get quickly going on something that continues directly to production yeah. or something that can actually be used. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, I'm not and, smart enough and to know what that is. Also, looks for like. um, on the more organizational aspect, uh, we had a really good experience with O'Reilly Media, um, and we we worked with an internal team on from there, and it was a mix of developers and designers, and they were all amazing people that didn't have the opportunity before to actually work together hand yeah. by hand. Um, so actually. For people who are designers and don't know how to code and they feel that, like threatened or like, kind of like uh, impeded to do the stuff they're imagining in code, collaboration is really, as uh, they were saying before, is really a, a really powerful tool to, you have an idea, you ping pong, uh, there is a developer. Developers right. love uh, creative input as well. Like they, they like being treated as creative people. Yeah. Um, so 
whenever we manage to create that collaboration environment, all this kind of more in like um, kind of like encode development uh, happens much more easily. Yeah, like yeah. the designer looking over the shoulder of yeah. things explored through code is yeah. also a really good scenario. We we need that. I mean, like we need yeah. more of that. Yeah, lots. And lots, if you look back in history, like like we were showing before. Designers have always worked with craftsmen, even, they're, even, the, if, even if they're not experts. You go and ask, and you, you look at behind them, and like, you get your hands dirty, and you mess it up, and then yeah. they fix it. Um, and that also creates uh, a lot of uh, creative input. Yeah. You hear that, designers? Annoy your developers more. Like, <laughs> please, please. Like, seriously, that's why, that is super welcome. Um, loads more questions. We, we got to get going, but I'll, I will say er, one, one more question. Did you use the marquee tag for the web? <laughs> <laughs> I, I have to know. I'm not sure. Does it work anymore? There was a time where it didn't work, I but I feel it like works. I think now you need to make it with CSS animations. Mm. We didn't use CSS. Valve, Valve, Val, we need your expertise. You? Yeah. <laughs> Anyways, so yeah, that's a huge opportunity. Everyone, give it up for Rune and Thanks Martin. Thank you.